Hey, aloha. Uh, it's almost Halloween, but welcome to this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We're back in the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I've uh, been on the road a little bit. Sorry I missed you guys, uh, but I've got a great guest for you today and a great episode. Um, Jerry Wilkins is with us today. He is the principal of Active Risk Survival. Uh, what he's going to share with you, I think, is relevant to the entire industry. 99% uh, of you do not know what we're going to talk about today. I assure you that. Jerry, aloha. Thanks for taking some time to join us today on this busy Halloween week. Uh, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Great. I really appreciate it. Um, just so our audience can get to know you a little bit, for those who don't know you, um, why don't you share a little bit of your history, background, as much as you care to share, and then we'll, uh, we'll get on to the okay. episode. Well, my background includes 35 plus years in this industry, including some law enforcement background. About seven years ago, I decided to join a volunteer organization. I'd been very active in volunteer service when I was younger, but I had kids and uh, my primary goal when I had kids was to be a good dad, but I chose the Coast Guard Auxiliary as an organization I wanted to join. There were some things I wanted to be able to do in the, the auxiliary. Uh, one was doing search and rescue and what they refer to as mom's patrols. Uh, marine observation missions, which required that I take some training. Uh, the first training I had to take was IS-100, which is offered by FEMA for free. It's three hours, but it was incident command. When I took the training, uh, I actually took it because I wanted to get the certificate so I could move on and start doing some of the fun stuff. But I literally woke up in the middle of the next night and realized that I didn't know anything about what I had just learned. Mm. So I went back and retook it. I couldn't test it because I'd already tested out, but I recognized that there's this amazing critical incident response protocol out there that our industry uh, has completely overlooked. Yeah. Well, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I don't, I can't do a little bit of anything. So I took <laughs> 200 and 300 and 400 and 700 and 800, basically have a, a, a two page, uh, document of all the different trainings that I've taken. As I started looking at that, I looked at one of the biggest threats that we see in today's world, and that's active shooter. Even though they're extremely low probability for most people, the consequences are so significant that we have to think about active shooter. What if? What would we do if? So I decided to take some active shooter training, and on December 2nd, 2015, and we'll get back to that date in just a second, I was standing in the BWI airport getting ready to board an airplane and fly to Oklahoma City to take Alice instructor training. Ah. And the reason why December 2nd, 2015 is an important date is that is the date of San Bernardino. Mm. So I was standing in the airport watching uh, an event. I think it still holds the record for most rounds fired. Mm. Active shooter event while I'm preparing to go take training to keep people alive during these events. Yeah. Uh, wow. When I got to the Alice training and Alice started explaining the acronym, alert, lockdown, inform, counter evacuate, mass notification immediately jumped in my head when they said alert. Mm -hmm. When they said lockdown, I don't know any access control panel that doesn't have the ability to lock down. And then the one that was most critical, when we come back to the I in form and you recognize that we have all of this critical information available through, to us through our access control, through our video surveillance, I literally stood up in the middle of the class and the instructor looked at me and said, are you OK? And, <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm processing. You've got to let me sit back down and kind of rethink this. But I started to recognize that in the Alice program, which is excellent, when they talk about alert, lockdown, and form, they don't necessarily apply the technology that's there. Yeah. Um, so I thought, you know, maybe I need to learn a little bit more about this. So I, I obviously took uh, Run, Hide, Fight, which is available again for free on the FEMA website, the independent study website. It's one hour. Uh, I took the Avoid, Deny, Defend instructor training through Texas uh, University yeah, of Texas. University of Texas, yeah. So through the alert program, through the crash program, I started to get a more clear picture and I started researching and I specifically researched San Bernardino 
a great extent and unfortunately found audio clips from law enforcement where they were asking someone if anyone can make a PA announcement, wow. have them come to you. Wow. So the public address equipment was in place. Has anybody found that access control card yet? <laughs> so yeah. you had small cadre sure. diamond formations pushing through this building, trying to, in essence, breach fire doors that were behind mag locks mm -hmm. that were operated by access control. So you were, in essence, putting these brave law enforcement officers in the fatal funnel in order to breach that door yeah. when, in fact, they could have simply swiped the card down the quarters and made their tactical entry. Mm -hmm. The reality is, if you read the after action report on San Bernardino, video is mentioned twice. It's mentioned once in that there was video surveillance on the command post for protection of the incident command post. And just as kind of an afterthought, someone mentioned that they actually observed the black car or the black SUV drive back by the front door. Mm. The reality is the law enforcement guys that made entry that day were extremely brave but the shooters were gone. Mm -hmm. So for roughly 30 minutes, the folks that had been wounded, injured, whatever you want to refer to it as, yeah. were not able to get medical assistance because they didn't know the shooters were gone. When in fact, when the first uh, entry team made entry, there was no threat. It would have in essence been classified as a cold zone. Yeah. So, you know, I went on from that and I thought, well, gosh, I bet I need to better understand what law enforcement does. So I got certified as a solo engagement SWAT operator. When I look at what medics can do, if they can get on scene quick enough and get on target quick enough, the number of lives that can be saved, you know, the statistics tell us that 80 percent of all gunshot victims bleed to death. Mm. So I took rescue task force operator school and got certified as a rescue task force operator. Not that you want me in a gunfight. <laughs> or that you want me as your medic. There's guys that are a lot better at it than me. Sure. But I wanted to understand where we as an industry, and when I say we as an industry, where the security industry fits into this puzzle. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I find we don't. Yeah, uh, I have not found a single incidence yet of an active shooter event where there wasn't technology in place. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I've only found one where the technology was properly leveraged because wow. it was not, I'll repeat, was not part of the emergency response plan, the emergency operations plan, the emergency action plan. So whether you want to call it an EOP, ERP, or EAP, the technology that, that we sell on a daily basis is not factored in. Yeah, not part of so the that's, solution. So that's kind of the history of where I got to where, yeah. I, where I am now. I've, I've researched all these events. Parkland is the absolute heartbreaker. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Parkland event, there was video, there was access control, there was mass notification. Shooter was in and out in seven minutes. It's all on video. But it was roughly 58 minutes before the building was downgraded from a hot zone and it went directly from hot to cold. So for roughly 51 minutes, you were in a cold environment, but no EMS was allowed into the building. And then just so if you our, were experiencing massive hemorrhaging, you bled to death. Yeah, maybe elaborate for our audience a little bit about the, uh, the that's, there's some change going on there to enter what's called a warm zone and, and to train some guys to go in with, uh, into what's probably a hot zone, but you know, maybe they're further back to deliver treatment. Um, talk a little bit about some of that, what, you, what you've seen in a trend there. So I know that's changing a little bit. Well, we're, uh, DOJ has just released a whole bunch of grant money to get more EMS personnel qualified okay. to actually become rescue task force operators. And what that means is when we look at hot, warm and cold zones, a hot zone is where there's direct gunfire. Right. Medics are not going into that environment right. unless they're also cross sworn as law enforcement. Sure. When we look at warm zones, there's the potential for violence, but no immediate gunfire in that area. Now it's potential to, to reignite, but these operators, these rescue task force operators have been trained to embed in a tactical stack in a gunfighter stack and actually move with that stack and get dropped at locations to provide medicine for injured people. Yeah. They can also, of course, provide medicine to the, the first responders. 
And then finally, there's a cold zone where it's been identified that there is no, no risk, no known risk uh, to folks entering. So EMS then, whether trained or not, can go in and start putting their tourniquets, their chest seals, their, you know, whatever mm-hmm. um, to, to save lives. Um, so you're, you're seeing a number of agencies. I've been told, I have not been able to confirm this, but I've been told in the Parkland shooting, I know for a fact that EMS was staged within 200 yards of what they refer to as the alpha door, the main entry door to the facility. I've been told that there were guys that had rescue task force training in there, but, and they were begging to go in, but they were not allowed to go in. Wow. Uh, Law enforcement had control of the scene and law enforcement controlled the designation hot, warm or cold, and they opted to keep it a hot zone. So any aid that the kids got was from, actually the other than the original responding agency dragging children out and putting them on stretchers once they got them into an area that was classified as safe and that's just that's unacceptable there were 15 high definition cameras in that facility there is video of the entire event so there was absolute situational awareness to the first responders that they didn't know they had yeah and they didn't know they had it because it was not part of the emergency operations plan yeah, and before we get off, because I do want to talk about that technology gap a little bit, but um, s- since 2015, do you do you think we've learned enough from these events that now we've we've got a better handle on how to train folks in a facility to plan for their operations to integrate the technology? Or do you think we're still we still got a really broad gap there? We're still light years away from that. Okay. Um, you know, there's a question that I ask every end user. If I'm invited out to talk to someone, I ask a very simple question in my mind, but it's how do you currently resource type your electronic countermeasures Mm -hmm. as part of your critical incident, all hazard response plan? Yeah. Now, if you break that question down, it's very simple, resource type. Well, if we look to FEMA and DHS for a definition of resource type, it says clearly, categorized by capability yep. electronic countermeasures well let's face it anybody in this industry knows what access is knows what video is uh knows what ids is knows what mass i mean we know all this stuff but the last part of the question is what what kills you as part of your critical incident all hazard response plan yeah and the reality is if you pulled a hundred eops from anywhere from Fortune 50 to Fortune 5,000 companies, and you looked at their EOP, if you found two that actually spell out the workflow, in other words, this is what we're gonna do, these are the steps we're gonna take, Mm -hmm. and that workflow included technology, I'd be shocked if you found two that have really done it. Yeah, it seems like the table, um, the tabletops always talk about duties, responsibilities. You see the people, and the, but there's no there's no uh, integration of their actions with the technology, and no plan to for the people arriving on site or or whatever it may be. There's no I even see there where there's no there's no one who's who's the chief communicator, for example. Like that's not spelled out what that means. They might call them that, but how they're going to communicate and what they're going to communicate and with what is never. It's just not part of it. Well, if you look at the very basics of incident command, when you talk about chief communicator, are we talking about liaison within, or are we talking about who is going to be our point of contact to media? You see that stepped on every day, yet incident command clearly defines how to utilize a public information officer, how to utilize a JIC, a joint information command, if necessary. And it just, it never seems to get done. Anytime you see... Right. Anytime you see a, and we'll go back to Parkland for a minute, the high sheriff step in front of the microphone, you've seen a mistake made. Yeah. Because he's not the public information officer. You know, a public information officer is never giving opinions. Yeah. A public information officer is giving known information only. Yeah. And they don't say, I can't comment on that. Because that's, I mean, when I took the the Coast Guard public affairs training, I was fortunate enough they sent me uh, for three days out to Alameda, California. You just don't say no comment. That's yeah. that's not what you that's say. That's as bad as it gets. Yeah, I've done. I've sat through some of those uh, 
some of those uh, um, uh, publicity briefings, you know, when, they, when you get trained how to communicate and what you're supposed to say. We're going to take a, a short break, about one minute, and uh, we'll be right back with Jerry Wilkins. Hang around. Aloha, my name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Duration. You are watching Think Tech Hawaii. I will be hosting a show here every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. and we will be talking to a lot of experts and guests around sustainability, social justice, the future here in Hawaii, progressive politics, and a whole lot more. So please tune in and thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, aloha and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Studios. This is Security Matters Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, and we're talking with Jerry Wilkins. I want to get right back to it. Um, Jerry, you were, you, were, you were bringing up an episode at Parkland where people were doing things wrong, although the training is very clear about what to do. Um, how often do you see them just not using information that's available? Well, it's almost easier to say how often do you see them using the technology that's there or the information that's there. Because it's almost and not, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. In, in my research, I don't see it. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the Virginia Beach shooting that just occurred back in August, yeah. uh, law enforcement performed amazingly well. I mean, uh, they had one officer, you actually hear him sprinting from their headquarters, which is only a couple hundred yards away from where the building, the number 12 building was. No disregard or no regard for his safety whatsoever. He had an active shooter event. He'd been trained to enter the building, engage the hostile. He did exactly that. Uh, when you look at what EMS did, they were spot on. They set up a command post, uh, started working through their protocols, which is kind of unique, but it's unique to the fire service because all the fire service does it. Mm -hmm. Yet when they get the shooter hemmed up, they can't get to him because he's behind a locked access control door. Yeah was the access control part of the critical incident response plan yeah. no yeah. so for roughly 38 minutes you had injured victims that were being drug out of the building through what was i guess internally classified as a cold corridor which is amazing i mean that's spot on with what's supposed to be done when in fact a simple swipe of the card and they could have eliminated that threat downgraded everything to cold and had just a, a, a surge of medics come in and start putting medicine on people. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this bleed time, we're, we're talking about typically minutes, right? We need, we need to get a compress. We need to get compression on that, that wound. If it's a, 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 a throw out your cavity wound of some type, I guess even in a leg, it could hit an artery or something, which I know arterial bleeding is really fast. Um, what, what, well, ar arterial bleeding is, is really the problem. Yeah, okay. Femoral, brachial, in other words, leg, arm. But a $10 to $30 tourniquet solves that problem. Okay. Now, when we talk about chest bleeding, if, if they're bleeding directly into the thoracic cavity, mm -hmm. that's a problem. But what we see so often with these high velocity rounds is through and through shots. And what happens is the hole becomes a way for air to get in. So every time the mm -hmm. diaphragm goes up, and then goes back down, air gets into the chest cavity, mm. and then you end up with something called a tension pneumothorax, which is a simple $3 chest seal put on there so that air is not entering that chest cavity can be the difference between life and death until they can get to, you know, they, they talk about sure. the golden hour. Yeah. Typically, if you can get someone who is alive to a medical a trauma center within an hour, it's unlikely that that person's gonna die unless mm. they're already clinically dead when when you start working on them sure you know if you've got exposed brain brain matter when you look at salt or look at start a couple different triage methods you're going to move on sure uh, gotcha. you, you save the ones you can 
Well, let's um, let's talk about how to do that. Let's talk about a little bit a bit of that guidance. So I know um I know I've heard you your talk about NFPA three thousand. Um, we've got about you know six or so minutes left. So let's let's try to walk through the a bit of the why. I know you teach this in your academy. Um, take us through some of the some of the uh, requirements that you think drive the why we should be training our industry on, on this information? Well, for any of, of the folks listening that have seen any of Simon, Simon Sinek's work, mm -hmm. he talks about the golden circle, the how, the what, and the why. Well, we sell the what and the how for the most part. Yeah. It's a five megapixel camera that's deployed on a internal network, a production network, a security network, whatever. It's VLAN, it's, it's whatever. It's the what and the how. Yeah. When we think about the customer's why, we rarely get to that. Well, what mm -hmm. is the customer's why? Well, they want to mitigate risk. Uh, what is risk? Well, it's the fear of being sued. It's the fear of people being killed. You know, it, it's, it's all different types of things that we rarely get to when we have that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, when I talk to people and ask them about the simplest risk formula, which is R equals T times V over C times I, risk outcome equals threat, active shooter, vulnerability, failure to plan, impact number of people that gets killed over C. And the C is countermeasures. That's not my formula. Okay. That is the standard, simplest risk formula. So what are countermeasures? Well, video is countermeasure. Mm -hmm. Access control is countermeasure. Uh, mass notification is a countermeasure. Policies are a countermeasure. Procedures are a countermeasure. Yeah. And under that subgroup of policies and procedures is training. You know, I ask people all the time that says, yes, we would use our technology if we had a critical incident. OK, when was the last time you drilled against <laughs> that incident? Yeah, oh, we did it a month ago. Great. Mm. Show me the hot wash. Show me your after yeah. action and show me in your hot wash the impact that the technology had. Yeah. If it's not spelled out as part of the way you dealt with that incident, it's not part of your EOP, period. Gotcha. End of sentence. Yep. So where do we look for guidance? You know. So far, we talked about a lot of bad news. Well, when we look at NFPA 3000, came out May 1st, 2018, it's an Asher program, Active Shooter Hostile Event Response Plan, that they say is a, a great way to plan for, respond to, and recover from an active shooter event. But here's the kicker. It goes on to say it's defensible, adaptable, and implementable. Okay. Key word being defensible. When you look at the lawsuits that are coming out now, whether it's the Walmart in El Paso, the Aurora, Illinois shooting, um, where the employee went in and killed the four HR people, yeah. uh, who knows what will come out of Virginia Beach, Parkland, there's 22 parents that have put together another lawsuit. That lawsuit had originally been thrown out, but the Federal Commission came out with a report that said schools are not only responsible for teaching and keeping students safe, but they're also for leading, responsible for leading them in times of emergency. So if we're not looking at things like NFPA, if we have a late night retail establishment and we're not looking at guidance that OSHA has produced called OSHA 3153, if we're in healthcare and we're not looking at the guidance OSHA put out called 3148, if we're in education and we're not utilizing PASS, Partner Alliance for Safer Schools, we can't say we've met industry best practice. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we're not defensible. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And you know, one of the funny things, when you look at NFPA 3000, and we talk about that a great deal in, in our in our training. It's 42 pages long. Yeah. It's not war and peace. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's something that the average person can read in a night and reread the second night and absorb. But one of the real problems with NFPA 3000 is it calls out terminal or it, it actually has a statement shall utilize NIMS and ICS yeah. protocols. And that's the now, National Incident ask, Management System, right? Right, an incident command structure. Yeah. If you ask folks in our industry, what is NIMS? What is ICS? They're like me seven years ago. They don't have a clue. Yeah. Yet it's this amazingly well-developed, 
resource management plan. And when we think of resources, that's people, that's infrastructure, that's technology, that's policies and procedures, that's and all it just gets left. That's like our countermeasure coordination document. And it's given right. to you. It's spelled out how you do it. You just need to adapt it for your own organization. And it's free. And it's free. You know, oh, people yeah. say, well, I forgot that. that. Yeah, free 99. You know, how do you put together, right, how do you put together an emergency operations plan? Well, there's a document online through DHS called the CPG 101 Comprehensive Planning Guide. Yep. And it's a paint by numbers. This is the way I develop a comprehensive emergency operations plan. Well, how do I do a threat assessment? Well, if you purchase the NFPA document, which is a whopping $52, it comes with three survey forms to help you develop a, a correctly done threat assessment. Sure. And then if you pull out the CPG 201, which is Thera, Threat and Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment, and start applying what you learn there, it's not hard to develop this. And, you know, one of the common responses I get, oh, we'd use our technology. No, you won't. Yeah. You will not rise to the occasion. You will fall to your level of training, yeah. period. Yeah. So don't think you're going to pull a rabbit out of your hat when you yeah. go right a boom, as the FBI would say. Yeah, especially in, you know, the other in times of duress, right? In times of duress, that's the last time you want to come up with a plan. You're going to, you're going to react as you've been trained 100%. We know that military taught me that. We got about a minute left, Jerry. So take us home. <laughs> you know, my, my, my take home speech here is, is very okay. simple. You're investing time, capital dollars in technology. Invest a little bit of time in bringing your integrator, bringing your consultant, bringing whoever you're utilizing to help you develop this security plan and make sure that you're developing a comprehensive all hazard response plan. Whether it's tornado, whether it's the evacuation or the drill that went off incorrectly in Hawaii, I guess it was last year. What is uh, your yeah. plan gonna be if a tornado is rolling in? or if a severe thunderstorm. If you don't have a plan, again, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to your level of training. And, and of course, the other thing is if you train till you get it right, you'll fail under pressure. These, these, these concepts that you produce must be simple. Yeah. They must be executable when you're in the worst frame of mind you could be in. Yeah, and they need to be understood by everybody and practiced often and modified as needed. All the time. Jerry, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. If you guys wanna learn more, check out the Academy, Active Risk, uh, Active Risk Survival. Uh, he's got an Academy goes on so often. Check it out online, get signed up, get your people trained, save some lives. That's what it's all about. Appreciate you joining us today. Aloha everybody, take care.